Hi everyone, welcome to Blast Points in the Spotlight webinar with William Sapone of People's Natural Gas. I'm Marianne Hollihan, the Marketing and Communications Manager at Blast Point, and I'll be the facilitator for today's webinar. Our In the Spotlight webinar series is meant to highlight the amazing work that our partners and customers are doing and allow them to share their considerable expertise with others. We're thrilled to have William Sapone joining us today to discuss how data is shaping the future of energy. Hi, William. Thanks so much for being willing to talk with us today. Yeah, hi, Marianne. Thank you for having me. Um, before we jump into our Q&A with William, let's go over a few logistics. Uh, our agenda today is as follows. Um, we'll do welcome and instructions, uh, then I'll read a brief bio of William, um, then we'll, most of our time today will be in a Q&A with William, and then um, hopefully we'll have some time for an audience Q&A at the end. And that brings us to audience participation. Um, we're really glad that you decided to join us today, and we would love to hear from you at the end of our webinar. You can submit questions anytime using the Q&A channel at the bottom of your screen, and during the last 10 minutes or so of the webinar, we'll do our best to address them. If you're having any kind of technical difficulty, you can reach out using chat and we'll do our best to resolve the issue. So without further ado, um, I want to introduce our guest today. Uh, William Sapon has dedicated his career in the energy sector to ensure our US energy delivery systems are reliable, resilient, secure, and sustainable through efforts to modernize and strengthen our energy grids. Currently, William serves as Clean Energy and Transportation Advisor at People's Natural Gas, the largest natural gas distribution company in Pennsylvania, specializing in grid edge innovation and alternative fuel vehicle opportunities. Prior to People's Natural Gas, William earned his MBA with a concentration in strategy and operations from the University of Pittsburgh's Katz Graduate School of Business. During his MBA program, he worked with the Environmental Defense Fund, Conservation International, and the Student Conservation Association on topics ranging from applications of distributed energy resources in commercial buildings to commercial deployment of energy storage technologies. William has nearly 10 years experience in the energy sector. He previously served as project manager at OS Comp Holdings Energy Storage and Transportation Practice, where his leadership was a key component to innovation efforts and to business development initiatives for new products. William holds a BS in Mechanical Engineering from Prairie View A&M University, and William is an influential sustainability advocate and steward of the environment. Thanks so much for joining us, William. No, this is exciting, thank you. <laughs> So to get us started, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and what drew you specifically to your area of expertise? Yeah, that's ex exciting. And actually, I definitely want to be able to tie it to what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, what's exciting about energy and sustainability is that uh, they kind of function uh, as a symbiotic relationship. You know, one drives the other and vice versa. Uh, and before we go into, into details, definitely want to be able to hit a few points in today's uh, uh, webinar. We want to be able to talk about our trends that we're seeing in our industry, what's driving those trends, the power grid as it is today, uh, the, our focus within people's natural gas, which we'll be discussing distributed generation, alternative fuel vehicles, renewable energy, and infrastructure improvement. That sounds great. Thanks again. Um, so our topic today is framed as a question, how will data shape the future of energy? Um, but I think in order to talk about the future, it seems like we need to start with the present and how data is being used now to increase industry value. Can you give us a brief overview of current issues and trends in the energy industry that utilize data? Yeah, so what's exciting is that we're actually, in my day-to-day -day job, we're always looking at trends. And just based on the information that we've seen and the research that we've, that we've done, uh, we've kind of narrowed down to these five main points. Uh, electrification, decentralization, digitalization, decarbonization, and democratization. And then just to give you kind of an idea of, of what it, of each of these points are, electrification just really means the electrification of large sectors of the economy, such as transporting and, and heating, and one of the key technologies that we're seeing in this, in this uh, trend is electric vehicles or alternative fuel vehicles, as we normally call it. Uh, decentralized, decentralization is really what's driving uh, customers to be more active uh, in the energy system. Uh, one of the key technologies here are combined heat and power, microgrids, wind and solar, and energy efficiency. 
uh, digitalization, uh, this is going to be the key for today's topic. And one of the things that I want to note for digitalization is that it's the fundamental component of the digital grid, which will allow utilities to leverage data across the organization. And what we mean by that is we have to look at the key technologies here, uh, smart metering, remote control and automation, uh, in, and the internet of things. Uh, decarbonization really comes down to sustainability and, and, and those are reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and their democratization, we're seeing that a lot of the customers that we're dealing with want to be more involved and, and, and have more participating uh, uh, portion in the energy uh, value proposition. That's great. Uh, thank you so much for giving us this breakdown. This is really helpful. Um, did you want to talk a little bit more about this slide? Mm -hmm. I see you've got like, kind of, kind of have it broken down into three other groups here. Yes, yes. One of the things that we, when we look at trends, we, we want to be able to understand what are those, the underlying drivers that are really pushing us towards these trends. Uh, we've noted three here. There's probably more, but we wanted to keep this simple. Uh, one of the things that we're really seeing is the decreasing cost in energy technologies. And we're just going to go in and start seeing that a lot more with battery technologies and solar and wind as well. Uh, energy technologies are also enabling the innovative business models that are built to empower customers. Again, customers want to be, be able to participate in the energy grid and where they are, you know, uh, purchasing and, and how do they, how they actually be able to use that energy uh, within their businesses. And, there, and then lastly, uh, sizable improvements to, to asset utilization, which really comes down to, to energy efficiency and being able to use our systems more efficient. That's great. Um, we at Blastpoint really like the term empowered customers. Uh, one thing that we've been working on recently is helping companies to understand their customers and kind of like what the customer life cycle is. So that really strikes a chord with us. Um, but what I'm hearing you saying here is that uh, it seems like smart energy initiatives are kind of the hot topic right now. Um, and they're central to innovation in energy. How does this impact the energy grid and how we understand energy in general? Well, in order for us to really talk about the future and, and how we can leverage data to make more efficient uh, you know, operations for, for utilities and their infrastructure, we really have to understand what's, what traditionally how the world is today. Uh, one of the things to note here is that as the world is today with the electric grid, 62% uh, of that power that's being generated is lost through line losses and other losses uh, at the generation plant. Uh, what's one of the key things that we want to be able to know uh, in this webinar are five key things. One of them is that utilities, and this goes for electric and natural gas utilities, they're being pressure, pressured to maintain uh, their systems uh, very reliably. Uh, the second one is to improve resiliency. Uh, they're also looking at at being be able to integrate renewables that are coming online and then also enhance the customer offering and services and ensure that you know financial performance all at the same time uh, the second uh, key point is that renewables are not going away given the decreasing cost of technology as well as the growing uh, prominence of, of global sustainability and we're seeing that repeatedly you know globally uh, the third key point that i wanted to make sure that we we, we capture is that utilities are only scratching the surface of their digital potential when it comes to operational efficiency and reliability and customer experience. And four, the number of, of alternative fuel vehicles like electric vehicles, natural gas vehicles, or hydrogen vehicles uh, are going to increase in the next few years, while effective alternative fuel vehicle infrastructure location is missing. Uh, so meaning that mm -hmm. there aren't enough refueling or recharging stations uh, that are out there to support the growing number of, of alternative fuel vehicles that we're, we're going to start seeing. Yeah, and that's really um, important. Yes. And then last, uh, because this is a, a data, you know, a webinar, data without intuition can be inadequate to make decisions mm -hmm. uh, and vice versa. So it's really good to not only capture, but be able to understand and be able to tell a story with the data that you're capturing. Yeah. Um, and that's actually uh, one of the main things that our CEO, Allison Alvarez, always talks about when, uh, for a reason why she started our company is because data needs to tell a story. Um, so it seems like 
a lot of kind of underneath what, of what we're talking about here today is like, what is the story that data is telling us about energy and how can companies kind of tap into that? Right. Um, so this world of tomorrow slide is really interesting too. Um, and I think we'll kind of use that as like a, a launching point for talking about how Peoples is addressing the changing energy landscape. Yes, uh, what's interesting is in this slide is versus the, the previous slide is that it's, we're really talking about an ecosystem here, you know, where before as consumers, we would only purchase for the energy we needed and we didn't care where it came from. I think now transparency is gonna be critical in understanding data mm -hmm. and being able to understand where your power comes from. Uh, you know, more, more transparent about pricing and things like that. So I think utilities are starting to realize that customers, again, because they're becoming empowered, they're looking for alternatives. Uh, you know, they could very well defect from the grid and go mm -hmm. all renewables. But we're also seeing that they're also thinking about how this impacts as an ecosystem. So customers understand that by being connected to the, to, to the utility grids, uh, they can achieve resiliency, which is very important as we're experiencing natural disasters and other factors that are affecting uh, our world today. What's mm -hmm. interesting is with this slide, we're, we're seeing that there's different factors in play here. You know, decentralized power generation, renewable energy technologies are coming into play. Uh, battery storage is also gonna be key. And then also, again, the electrification of the transportation sector is, is going to be key. And understanding that by generating power on site, you can be at most efficient, uh, whereas you're losing 62% with the, with the traditional grid today. Through technologies like combining and power, you can have an overall efficiency of 87%. Which is big. That's yes. a, a very high number. Um, so, yeah, it's... I like how you're kind of focused in these particular areas. Um, I think first, we'd love to hear a little bit more about CHP. Yes. Uh, if you can talk to us about that. And specifically, like, is it a product? And who are your customers for this? Yeah, not a problem. What's interesting is that combined heat and power is, is actually just an umbrella term to use to signify various different technologies. The one first thing to note is that CHP is an efficient and reliable way to generate heat and electricity from one single source. Uh, in our case, we utilize natural gas as the main source. Uh, what's interesting is as, as customers that are thinking about uh, you know, increasing their electric load or being more efficient on site or thinking about reducing their carbon footprint, a lot of companies are, are, are noting that by producing power on site and also capturing some of the energies that are currently lost traditionally with traditional power generation, uh, because of this new efficiency and, and achieving the 87%, they really, this really translates into a 20 to 30% reductions uh, in economics, so reducing in your energy costs. Uh, and this is because uh, as the CHP technology is able to generate power, uh, you're capturing all the power that you can out of the system. And at the same time, there's heat losses that are being captured and being uh, utilized for heating and cooling a specific business or, or, or building or facility. Mm -hmm. So that's where the, the the uh, reductions in costs come into play. That's really great. What's exciting about uh, combined heat and power is that it's a very versatile uh, technology. Again, we talked about that it's just a, a, an umbrella term for different types of technologies. The main four that we really are looking at, at from a people standpoint and our customers are combustion engines, which are your, your typical uh, internal combustion engine that you see in your, in your vehicle. Uh, a lot of the CHP manufacturers, because this is a very well-known technology, customers are also uh, aware of, 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 of this technology because they use it in their day-to-day -day mm -hmm. operations. Everybody drives a, a vehicle, so everybody's mm -hmm. aware of these technologies. What's interesting is that uh, with, a, with a car engine, you can actually repurpose that into a combining heat, heat and power. Uh, you can generate uh, electricity and you can also extract the heat and utilize it on site. Uh, another key technology, that, uh, under the CHP umbrella term, uh, gas turbines. Um, and then micro turbines, which are actually a much, a much smaller replica of what a gas turbine is at a much smaller scale. Uh, again, because of its versatility and because of our wide range of customers with a utility, uh, CHP really is a really good fit for us because we're looking uh, at a spectrum of customers. You know, we have residential, we have co uh, commercial, and we have industrial customers. And depending on where they're, they're at, CHP can really uh, be a play for, for any of these types of applications. 
What's really interesting is that fuel cells are the most efficient way and more sustainably way to generate power um, because fuel cells are very much like a battery. Unlike most of the other traditional CHP applications, uh, fuel cells actually generate power uh, using an electrical chemical process. Mm -hmm. There's no combustion and it only produces uh, minuscule amounts of, 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 of greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. And as a byproduct, you actually generate water. So it's really interesting. That's really interesting. Yes. yes. Um, and I, I really like what you're saying about how customers are more involved in this process. Um, and I was wondering if, you know, did you as a company kind of think about all the different customers and what their needs are before you kind of decided on this? Yes. Uh, one of the things that we really think about our customers is, again, we have to understand, and this is where different uh, data visualizations mm -hmm. tools really come into play, mm -hmm. mainly because as you're thinking about customers, you also have to think about the infrastructure that is already in play. Uh, one of the things that we will be, want to be able to note that with traditional uh, power generation, uh, the, grid is, the grid is vulnerable. You know, we're talking about natural disasters. Uh, when we think about power lines, you know, mm -hmm. what, what's the first thing that really goes out when we have a storm? You know, power goes out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so natural disasters are, are, are one of the biggest things that are affecting our grid. Mm -hmm. uh, now that we're becoming digital as well, as we're seeing that, that trend, as we previously mentioned, cyber attacks are not becoming a big thing. Mm -hmm. Again, we're yeah. becoming vulnerable from that standpoint. And lastly, again, uh, talking about the energy inefficiencies. Uh, so again, as customers are really thinking about uh, uh, doing better for their community mm -hmm. and, and helping to reduce those gas emissions and cleaning their air, mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at all that information and, and helping, to, again, put a yeah. profile together right. to understand what their goals are right. and, and how, you know, which technology would be best fit mm -hmm. for those customers, correct? Yeah, and um, at Blast Point, that's actually one of the things that we're working on right now. Uh, we're working with some companies to create customer personas or profiles that help people segment their customer base. And so it seems like moving forward into the future, it's really helpful to undertake that so that you can understand what is the best technology to put our time and resources into. Right. The other key thing about CHP is the fact that it really fits this um, triple bottom line um, kind of format where it's, it's social, it's economic, and it's environmental. Mm -hmm. Again, as we, as we talked about the efficiencies, this really translates into a few things. First case, the customers are always looking for economics. They want to make sure that yeah. they're investing in things that are economic for their business. But now, now that uh, businesses and customers are being very sustainable, mm -hmm. they're looking at, at more than just the economics. They're looking at environmental aspect. They're looking at the social aspect. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to, CHP helps create jobs. Uh, it's the best use of our natural resources with, 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 with the gas that's beneath our feet. And it's environmental. It's helping, again, helping to improve our air quality uh, here in our Pittsburgh area. Yeah, well, and I like that you've broken this down into these categories because one thing that we think about on our end is how can we segment a customer base according to these priorities? Right. So maybe you would want to target customers who care more about the environmental end of things in a certain way, whereas people who are more concerned with the economic end of things, you would want to target them in a different way. Very correct. Um, we can talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how, uh, why natural gas when wind and solar are becoming viable forms of alternative energy. I wonder if like that's something that comes up a lot. Yes, it, and, and Moran, what's interesting is that, uh, again, I really love the, the way that you mentioned it earlier when you were talking about a narrative and kind mm -hmm. of telling that story. Yeah. And uh, I definitely want to be able to take our, our listeners here through a, mm -hmm. a quick story sure. about what's happening out in, you know, mm -hmm. as we're doing this research. One, from a social aspect, uh, there's a tons and tons of data out there that really helps organizations like People's understand what's happening out there and what information should be our customers uh, should, should know and, 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 and help factor into their decision-making process. What's interesting is that, uh, and for just a quick, Quick fun fact for our listeners out there: uh, most of the graphs and most of the information that's on on these slides are readily available out there. So this isn't private information. Right. What's interesting is that what I try to do my best to find mm -hmm. publicly available data right. so that 
not only this is information yeah. that's helping organizations like people mm -hmm. and a utility make decisions, but this is something that customers right. don't have to make an expense in mm -hmm. trying to get this data. This data is readily available. And for most of the graphs that are present in these slides, uh, there's a source beneath on, on the uh, mm -hmm. uh, bottom right corner if you want to follow along. Uh, yeah, that's perfect. What's interesting from the social aspect is that uh, NOAA is actually capturing data about weather patterns and how natural disasters are occurring more frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, they're increasing in intensity and increasing in the cost mm -hmm. that we're actually paying from, from a taxpayer standpoint uh, to address these, these, these issues. If we, and what's interesting about data visualization is if you only look at this graph, you can't really just uh, get more information from it and you mm -hmm. can't really take action. But if we go to our next slide, sure. what's interesting is that you take that same, same information mm -hmm. And you lay it out on a map and now you start seeing because a lot of people in the commonwealth here in pittsburgh pennsylvania you may be thinking well we don't have you know earthquakes or mm -hmm. wildfires that right. that that may be experiencing in california we don't have the hurricanes that may hit florida or texas mm -hmm. but as you start seeing this data uh, and you visualize it in a different way you start to see that uh, pennsylvania is actually in a territory where you know you have natural disasters happening, mm -hmm. uh, and we need, we need to be able to keep track of that information. And I'm right. glad that Noah is really taking the steps into capturing this information, right. and we're able to utilize this information to really take action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what I like about this particular visualization is that it's a little bit surprising. So yeah, I wouldn't necessarily think, oh yeah, Pennsylvania, that's where we're experiencing a lot of change right um but according to this heat map it's that's the case right right interestingly enough again as we talk about natural disasters and one of the things that we like to really discuss with customers is that the the idea of resiliency and reliability uh what's interesting is that you know you you can't really predict how you know how intense a storm will be or how it's going to impact your business but for a lot of our clients, like universities or hospitals that are really thinking about, you know, how will, will a power outage affect, you know, my customers? And again, a lot of them are like life safety mm -hmm. situations with hospitals. Yeah. And there's, there's people that can go off of power, not even for a minute or for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, and those really translate not only into like lives, but depending on what the institution is, it can really have an adverse effect economically to the business. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that with combined heat and power, because it relies uh, heavily and the primary source of fuel is natural gas, most natural gas lines aren't impacted as, as much when you have natural disasters. So this is a quick image where we're looking at um, uh, the city of, 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 of New York and how uh, places that actually have decentralized power generation were able to stay on uh, even though they got hit with a, with a storm. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to see how technologies are, are helping customers yeah. uh, keep the power on. Absolutely. And this is also, I think it's helpful to put this kind of data into a narrative too. I think that it shows that not only does data help you as a business make decisions, but it also right. helps you create this narrative for customers to kind of get them on board with your sustainability initiatives. Correct. Uh, the other point that, that we need to understand in the narrative of, of, of why sustainability and why the business case, and, and again, why natural gas and, or just decentralized power generation, which covers renewables as well, is that again, uh, we're seeing power prices increase you know, year to year, um, and, and that can, can definitely impact uh, businesses. Uh, the fact that with CHP, uh, you can actually project, you know, from year one, what your 10 year cost would be, because now what you've done is with a commodity like natural gas, that again, here in the Commonwealth, we're very rich in this natural resource, and we can actually predict um, and, and forecast that the price of natural gas within the next five to 10 years will remain uh, pretty stable. You can actually start uh, forecasting what, what the economics would be when you switch over from traditional power generation to on-site power generation which again, translates into 20, 30% uh, uh, savings in your utility bills. Which is also big. Yes. Uh, and then the other component of it as well is the environmental piece. And I think one of the key things when we're looking at data visualization and helping to tell a story is that 
you know, there's always been the claim to fame with natural gas that, you know, it's the cleanest burning fuel, but wh why is it that it is the cleanest burning fuel and, and cleaner than what? I mm -hmm. think that's kind of the question. And I think when you visualize w what you're comparing it to, you're comparing it to other uh, carbon fuels like coal, uh, diesel fuel, propane and gasoline. And when you look at the CO2 emissions compared to the same equivalent uh, energy content, uh, natural gas, again, is the lowest uh, uh, CO2 uh, emissions when compared to these other fuels. And, and that really comes down to that natural gas is a simple hydrocarbon. It's just a carbon atom with two, with four uh, hydrogen um, atoms as well. So it's a simple molecule. As we're talking about natural gas, uh, and we mentioned it about projecting and forecasting natural gas prices. It wasn't just long ago, back in 2005, where the, the price of natural gas was very volatile and customers were actually uh, incentivized to go off of natural gas mm -hmm. and go into diesel. It's, it's really interesting to just see, uh, visualize that information. And it really does tell a story. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go back to 2005 and 2006, you know, what was happening around that time? You know, you had Hurricane Katrina, you had Hurricane Rita coming in uh, that was really impacting oil prices. At the time, natural gas was tied to the price of oil, it has since been decoupled here in the U.S. And we and then because of the abundance in natural gas resources that, that were found just here in our own backyard in the, with the Marcellus and Utica shell, has really driven prices down, and they're expected to stay here for the long term. Interesting. For our listeners out there, again, that may not know what the Marcellus and Utica show are, again, this is a, a, a region uh, here in the Northeast where uh, natural gas has been found. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea, uh, Marianne, the production uh, capacity uh, here uh, for these two uh, shell formations, uh, can, we can expect natural gas uh, in, in the volumes of 500 trillion cubic feet. Just to, just to put that into perspective, the U.S. consumes about 22 trillion cubic feet per year. So if, if, if this was our only source of energy, mm -hmm. we could sustain the whole country with the Marcellus and Utica shell for, for the next 20 years, if that was our only energy source, yeah. just to put it into perspective, which is amazing. Yeah. Uh, we've only drilled 10% year to date, uh, and, and, and we've already created so many jobs and, and, and also, um, uh, the, the economic impact that gas and, jo and jobs have created. Uh, I think with the econ economics, it's 1.7 billion in local and, and state uh, uh, revenues uh, since 2012. So significant amount of money that is going to various different programs here in our Commonwealth. That's, yeah. I mean, this is a great summary of, of all of this. And I know that you want to talk a little bit about resiliency as well. Yes, uh, one of the interesting things with resiliency and that we want to be able to talk about, and you mentioned earlier about the comparison between renewables and, and CHP and utilization of natural gas. Well, one of the things that we really have to look at is, again, you, you, you need to be able to bring the metrics and, 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 and get the data so that you're comparing apples to apples. When you talk about uh, CHP, you're talking about it We'll make this simple. When we're looking at a 10 megawatt uh, CHP plant, and you compare that to a 10 megawatt uh, solar uh, photovoltaic plant, which is solar, or a 10 uh, megawatt uh, wind farm, what's interesting is that you can actually see that the, that the annual uh, CO2 savings are going to be more substantial uh, with the CHP plant, and that's because of the annual capacity factor. Again, CHP, because it relies heavily on natural gas as its primary fuel, uh, it's there uh, on demand when you need it uh, versus when you're looking at, at solar or wind uh, with, with their annual capacity factors being uh, much lower than that. So that really tells the story is that the fact that when you're looking at resiliency, you also have to look at the annual capacity factor to really make it a, a key decision about where your energy comes from. This, this slide actually kind of dives a little bit deeper into that and really tells an a, a interesting story. And this happened a few years back on August 21st. Um, this was in California. The utilities there, uh, again, because lunar eclipses, these, these are fairly common 
you know, we, we, we have the data that tells us when we can expect uh, the, these, these astronomical uh, events happening. What's interesting is that uh, because utilities knew in the year in advance uh, when this, this day would happen, uh, we can actually see and we can actually graph the, the power output from solar panels in California the day prior. So if you look at the brighter red color uh, 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 graph line, it actually maps uh, the power output uh, over the same time period as the, as the following day. And the following day when we ex actually experienced the solar eclipse, uh, California, the solar panels actually dipped down, which is interesting, mm -hmm. which is at the same time that the peak of the eclipse is happening in California. So, and what was interesting is because uh, the utilities in California knew of this, what, what they were doing is that uh, CHP uh, was actually coming in into, into play and really helping uh, uh, utilities tap into that power that was being generated mm -hmm. from natural gas to really help replenish the utility grid. Yeah, and I think this shows also how um, these different forms of energy are working together. And it's not just sort of like one is the answer, but all of them kind right. of like come together Correct. Um, to make sure that the grid has enough energy. Correct. Um, so next, uh, I know that Peoples is doing a lot of other things, um, utilizing data to kind of like fuel innovation. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about natural gas vehicles and what you guys are doing with those. Yes. So what's interesting is, again, we, we, we've seen a renewed interest in alternative fuel vehicles, you know, as, as we mentioned, the electrification of the transportation sector. But again, I think it really comes down to the application of where those vehicles will will, will make a play. Uh, what we're seeing is that there's still uh, vast amounts of application for natural gas vehicles. We're seeing uh, school buses, uh, uh, you know, 18 wheelers, uh, trucks. Actually, just a quick story uh, in 2018, last year, people's invested into 17 brand new uh, uh, bi-fuel F-150s that utilize uh, natural gas. And one of the main reasons, again, it really comes down to uh, re reliability and resiliency. We have over 100 years supply of American natural gas, you know, just beneath our feet here. What's interesting is also the cost of natural gas versus the cost of diesel. You can actually average out to about 60% or 62% in CNG savings. And again, because of, of, of the cleaner burning fuel with natural gas, you actually reduce carbon emissions uh, in the range of 20 to 30% as well. Yeah, that's really compelling information. Um, do potential customers wonder if NGVs have an advantage over EVs, for example? Yes, and that's actually a very good question. And maybe sometimes I really like to frame that question a little bit different. Sure. We we. We always want to be able to talk about what, what the problem is and why are, why are we talking about alternative fuels. Uh, one is that our air quality is unhealthy to breathe. And this is due mainly in part to the transportation sector. Uh, the solution is that NGVs deliver the, the largest and most cost effective reductions uh, in, in NOx emissions. And we, it really comes down to, to, to the metrics. Again, when, when customers are trying to make a decision whether to pick you know, diesel, electric, or natural gas, uh, it really comes down to the metrics and the data that you have in front of you to, to be able to make the best decision as possible. Um, one quick, quick case study is that we're gonna be looking at, at natural gas uh, transit buses. When you're making the case and when you're looking at it from a business standpoint and you're looking at what you want to invest, uh, most people are going to look at the cost of the technology versus what, it, what you're actually accomplishing. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that with natural gas vehicles or a, for a transit bus, you're looking at $500,000 capital expense to, to, uh, to buy that equipment. Again, if you're looking from a cost perspective, you may go with diesel because it's, 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 it's uh, much lower than that. Uh, or you may, may opt to not do electric because it's much higher than that. But you may be thinking, well, I could probably uh, achieve higher reductions in emissions by utilizing all the electric vehicles. But you're only, if you look at the difference between natural gas and electric, you're actually achieving the same, uh, almost the same uh, reductions in, 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 in NOx emissions at a much lower cost. So the metric here that we have to look at is the cost per pound of NOx reductions. So when you look at that figure and you combine all these other data points, uh, natural gas is the winner here, uh, $129 mm -hmm. per pound 
of, of NOx reductions versus when you look at electric, which is uh, about $200 per pound reductions. And it really makes a, a great case point for you know, why you would want to replace natural gas with diesel or replacing diesel with electric. Because if you look at the price mm -hmm. per pound uh, of NOx, uh, it's, it's a very expensive way to, to, right. to if you're wanting to reduce that, that cost. Right. And we talked about segmenting customers earlier. And so if you know one segment of your customer base is going to be honed in on price. And, uh, you know, we talked about how as a utilities company, you have lots of different types of customers, including other businesses. Right. So uh, people in the transportation industry thinking about their bottom line, um, this data helps make a case for NGVs. Correct. Okay, so when we're talking about um, NGVs and EVs, uh, just AVs in general, uh, we're talking about expansion and adoption. We also have to talk about refueling and recharging infrastructure. And um, people may think that this infrastructure doesn't exist yet, which is not actually true, as we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, what kind of data have you utilized to map refueling locations? Yeah, and, our, and what's interesting is definitely, uh, I think it is a myth that we don't have enough infrastructure to, to support alternative fuel vehicles. What's interesting again is that we're using publicly available data that's being captured by the US Department of Energy under the uh, Alternative Fuels Data Center. So they have a website where you can actually map and visualize where these stations are. So if you look at, and I've only captured, just because we're talking about natural gas vehicles here, I was able to capture the information about locations of where compressed natural gas, hydrogen and liquefied natural gas uh, refueling stations are here in the US and in Canada. There's close to 1600 as of when I looked uh, just a few, few days ago. Uh, and these are publicly and private, again, access points for, mm -hmm. for refueling. So customers will have, uh, you know, customers who have private refueling will have access to, to their own stations, but there's a lot of public stations available across the US. Uh, uh, I was talking to somebody from um, uh, the Natural Gas uh, Vehicle Association uh, here uh, that, that are represented in, in, in Washington, D.C., and they had mentioned that uh, a lot of their uh, members of that organization uh, are, have made the trip from the East Coast to the West Coast on an alternative fuel vehicle and nonstop, not having to worry about the mm -hmm. infrastructure. As we can see, there's definitely some gaps mm -hmm. in, in, in the U.S. Uh, that we definitely need to make sure that we, we address. Uh, but when we look at, you know, uh, here in our own state yeah. of Pennsylvania, it's, we're deaf. We can we're def see it. Yeah, you can really see <laughs> that we're, we're covered. But I definitely wanted to get a closer view uh, because the data, again, can be mm -hmm. deceiving right. how, you, how you actually um, uh, perceive the data. Uh, and how you visualize it. Mm -hmm. But when, you're, when we're looking at, at, at Pennsylvania, you can see that it's very concentrated into kind of the main three mm -hmm. cities that we have, yep. uh, Pittsburgh, you know, Harrisburg, and again in Philadelphia as well. So right now we can go from state, through, throughout the whole state uh, with having enough mm -hmm. refueling, but there's definitely uh, more that we can do. And again, I think one of the things that we, we need to be able to to do is, is, is not only is people's using this information, but other organizations are using mm -hmm. this information as well. And, I, and I, one of the key things that, that, that needs to be said is that customers, again, have access to this information. Mm -hmm. If they were just curious about making an investment right. in fleets, you know, uh, again, we've only focused on compressed natural gas, but if you go to the USDOE website for the Alternative Fuels Data Center, you can actually narrow it down to just hydrogen, you can narrow it down to electric, uh, and different types of fuels, biodiesel. Really so it's very, very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our uh, partners, the uh, Pennsylvania uh, DOT, or Department of Transportation, is, is, is utilizing this information to really help uh, uh, with their investments with the public-private partnerships that they've established in creating more of these stations across, you know, across the state. So they're, they're heavily using this data to make sure that they're they're making this investments where they're, they're needed. That's really interesting because it, it kind of uh, shows that this is helping you make partnerships too, which seems like that's very necessary um, in the changing landscape of energy. Uh, one thing 
thing I just wanted to say really quickly is that, um, so our, our CEO, Allison Alvarez, recently wrote a report on all kinds of alternative vehicle charging stations in the US. And that information is also available through the Blast Point system. Um, so we, we are uh, very interested in this particular situation, trying to map out where all of these stations are, just because it is so important for expanding infrastructure um, and for knowing uh, for example, like where to sell these cars, like Correct. where, you know, where should you open up like a place to sell these types of vehicles? Well, you need to know what kind of infrastructure is around you. So this kind of information is very important to like lots of different sectors that have to do with um, energy. So um, if anyone's interested, Allison has authored a report on this. And if anyone wants to look at it, feel free to send BlastPoint an email. Um, our email address will be on the final slide. And we're happy to share that report with you. Um, interesting I, fact, yeah. before we move from this slide, uh, it's interesting because I believe if you overlay um, the uh, sales of, of particular you know, uh, alternative fuel vehicles, you'll start to see that the infrastructure is being built around where those mm -hmm. cells are. So there's there's people that understand where the data is, mm -hmm. and they're leveraging this information to build that infrastructure mm -hmm. to support those vehicles. So it's, right. it's very interesting uh, of ways that people are utilizing this information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and going back to this idea of partnerships, which I think is really important, um, I wanted to ask you if you're specifically partnering with other organizations that have similar goals. Uh, definitely. I think one of the key things that we want to be able to note here is that as we're talking about alternative fuels and natural gas vehicles, there's actually a really interesting uh, thing that is happening within the, the, the natural gas industry. And it's this new thing that's uh, being called renewable natural gas, uh, which is exciting because it's, a, it's, a, it's ch chemically identical to, to fossil natural gas or traditional natural gas. But it's, it has a net zero greenhouse gas emissions it can be achieved when vehicles that are using RNG uh, are, are being fueled with, with, with this new fuel. Uh, the difference between renewable natural gas and fossil based natural gas is that it's captured above ground. So uh, there's a few places that we're actually, you know, that, that, that the utility is looking at. Primary landfills. Landfills have turned a challenge. We used to be methane, methane mm -hmm. uh, leakage into the atmosphere. They're turning that challenge into a revenue generating opportunity, which is exciting for us because now uh, for, with, with this new slide that we're looking at is there's four main points that we're looking at. Landfills, agriculture, municipal organic waste, uh, and, and, and wastewater treatment facilities as well. What's interesting is that uh, the people who are generating uh, these biogases and then turning them into and cleaning them up and turning them into renewable natural gas. What's exciting is that they're leveraging existing, you know, pipeline infrastructure that's already been in place. So, for instance, uh, folks that are generating this this biogas can help customers uh, get access to this by, you know, interconnecting with the existing pipeline. So, for for peoples, we're actually already interconnected to five landfills stations, Amazing. and we're we're a, a fraction of our of our of our gas that we're purchasing and, and distributing to our customers already come from a renewable source. And it's helping again, uh, heat our homes, uh, fuel our vehicles, and then again for the power generation sector as well. So um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your partnership with um, the Environmental Defense Fund at Google and CMU. Yes, and again, you were talking about you know organizations that have similar goals, and one of the things that you know as customers think or organizations or listeners may be thinking, well, how can I leverage data if I'm not you know tech savvy, if I, if I may not know where this information comes from? Your organization may not be built to be able to take information or leverage the data that you have, and then again, people was in this similar situation where we wanted to do good. We understood that there was issues out there. One of the biggest issues that we that we uh, understand is the issue of, of methane emissions from gas pipelines. Again, there's leakages with any infrastructure. And you, you, there's no way that you can take 100% of what comes in and distribute 100% of that. Again, there's different factors that come into play. Aging infrastructure, again, here in the Northeast, which we'll talk a little bit about. But again, what was interesting is that EDF worked with Washington State University to really come up with, with 
what this translates to. And um, they found out that as much as 854 gigagrams per year were being emitted into the atmosphere just from leaky pipes. Hmm. And this really translates into a big challenge for utilities because this translates to about 18.9 coal-fired power plants, uh, 15 million uh, passenger vehicles on the road, and $195 million in, in lost revenue due to lost gas. So it's a very, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very big challenge for utilities that, that needs to be addressed. And again, this isn't something that the utility can address by itself. So again, we reached out to EDF and invited them to the city of Pittsburgh. And one of the things that this report also, uh, we were also able to understand was that 17% of those emissions were, was coming from the, from the west, uh, west Coast and 34% was coming from the, from the Northeast, which is a very interesting fact because when you look at the size of the country, 34% uh, is actually coming from a smaller portion of the country and this is really due, 70% of those leaks in the Northeast are really due to older cast iron steel pipes. For people that are aware with the um, uh, pipelines and, and the history here in the US, they know that the first gas wells were put in place here in, the, in, in Pennsylvania and the, and the first pipelines were also here that were being distributing that natural gas into businesses and homes. So as you can imagine, uh, over hundreds of years that these pipes are have been placed. A lot of them are, are very, very old. And we're finding that, you know, not just here in Pittsburgh, but just across the Northeast. Uh, and companies need to start making investments uh, to really replace these with, with, with alternative materials that are last longer, uh, that again, will maintain that gas internally and be able to distribute that gas to our customers. What's interesting is that uh, as EDF uh, and, and, and the Washington uh, State University report came out. Uh, EDF understood that, again, it was going to take public-private partnerships to really address this issue. And again, because of the resources required to take action and to really leverage what was already there, partnerships really have to be formed. Uh, one of the key things that, that we did back in 2015 is that as we learned about this report, again, we invited EDF to come out Again, because Google has headquarters here in, in, in Pittsburgh, and, and we're also home to the Carnegie Mellon University. We partner up with these organizations and really wanted to tackle the idea of like where methane is being located and how can we leverage uh, some of the resources that EDF and Google had already. So one of the things that we actually did was we leveraged the technology that Google Maps had acquired with, with its infrastructure, with its vehicle technology, and we were able to use EDF and, and actually place uh, natural gas uh, methane detectors uh, on top of the, of the vehicles. And we're able to let leverage Google Maps to create a map across the city of Pittsburgh and, and really identify where leaks were coming from. What's interesting is that uh, because of this, in, this information, as you can see on this map that's in front of us right now, uh, there's a few places, even within, within the same street, you can have cleaner air and a, down the street, you can even have uh, a, 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 a red dot, which means a high concentration of, of, of methane, which was found because of this, this detector. It's really interesting. And this is what's really driving, driving um, our investments. Uh, every year, Peoples is really investing uh, heavily in replacing pipelines. And again, because of this information, we now know where to make yeah. those investments. Right. And we're leveraging our capital to be more, you know, more efficient and making sure that we're, we're, we're addressing this issue mm -hmm. here in the city of Pittsburgh, which actually led to people's actually committing to cutting methane emissions from our Pittsburgh distribution uh, system by 50%, which is a pledge, first of its kind here in the US, which is pretty amazing. And this was done again, just because of the confidence that the partnership with EDF and Google mm -hmm. and Carnegie Mellon is to really understand, hey, how can we get to, to where we wanna go and, and, and being able to benchmark and capture that data and, and, and see how year to year uh, our investments are, are helping to reduce those methane emissions. Yeah, so I'm kind of hearing you say a couple of things, like one, partnerships are important to kind of like utilize the data that's available. 
um, especially the situation like this, where you're trying to pinpoint specific areas where you need to do some work on infrastructure. Correct. Um, that's very important. Um, and just being able to visualize this data is so helpful in terms of where should we be investing? Um, where should we focus our attention here? So I think this is so useful in those specific ways. Um, so final question before we take some questions from everyone tuning in. Um, it seems like from everything you've talked about here today that Peoples is effectively utilizing data in several different areas from smart energy development to customer education to partnership development. But other companies may be finding it difficult to do that. Um, what do you think are the main roadblocks keeping energy companies from deriving value from their data? And how do you think they can take some steps to become more, more data savvy? Yeah, and it's interesting because one of the things that we really have to be able to address and, 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 and hopefully our listeners that are listening in today uh, understand is that the digital grid is not emerging. The technology is already here. So uh, as, 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 as organizations are, are investing in technologies and in, in infrastructure for their operations, um, a lot of, of their business are already capturing a lot of customer data, a lot of information that they could be utilizing. And I'm gonna reframe your question a little bit differently. Sure. One of the things that we have to be able to do is that, understand is that what your goals are when you're thinking about how to get started. You have to be able to understand where you want to go before you start uh, your, your process. And I, I've narrowed it onto three main uh, key things that I wanted to, 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 to leave you with. Is one, unlocking, you know, when you're leveraging data, you want to be able to unlock new customer segments. That's mm -hmm. one of the things that you benefit from, you know, looking at data. Mm -hmm. uh, from a utility standpoint, you also want to be able to improve the energy delivery process. Again, we're talking about how wind and, and renewables are coming into play. And that's creating a challenge for utilities to be able to integrate that information. By leveraging information and where these, these are located, uh, utilities are gonna be able to make you know, smart investments uh, and to be able to capture that information and to be able to operate these, uh, these assets remotely. And again, understanding that data as a, as a strategic asset, I think that's gonna be a key point in understanding uh, where you can actually start leveraging that information and how it's being captured. Those are really helpful. Thanks for breaking it down into three points like that. Um, so thank you so much uh, for sharing your knowledge on the future direction of the energy industry and especially how data plays a central role in innovation and outreach. Uh, it seems from what you said today that it's imperative for energy companies to find and utilize data to understand things like customer life cycles, increase customer buy-in to new technologies, plan infrastructure expansion, and those are to name just a few things. And we at Blast Point are very excited to hear you say that because we're currently working with some utility companies to, to accomplish those very things. Um, so your overview of what Peoples is doing really helps provide a snapshot of what data enables energy companies to do, so thank you. Yes, no, thank you. Um, so now I want to turn it over to everyone listening. Um, if you have any questions for William, please feel free to submit those using uh, the question tab at the bottom of your screen. To get us started, um, I have a question that I'm going to throw over to William. Um, what kinds of data do you think the energy sector should be paying closer attention to and how can this data expand business? Yeah, so what's, what's interesting is that um, here, in, even in the Commonwealth, uh, there's, there's uh, greenhouse gas emission data is mm -hmm. going to be very, very important. Uh, we're starting to see uh, uh, not only mandatory, but just voluntary uh, uh, submissions of how you, uh, organizations are, are affecting our environment. And what's interesting is that all this information is being captured at the state level. So, and then all this information is publicly available again. Mm -hmm. So understanding where you want to look at. So from, from a, from a energy perspective, uh, understanding, you know, where the gas emissions are coming from, you know, the more we understand about where they're coming from, the better we can to address them. So I think that's going to be the, the, the next thing that we're very going to be heavily focused on is, is greenhouse gas emissions, um, databases that, 
the state of Pennsylvania is putting out there. And again, helping to, to also help our, encourage our customers to be able to be more transparent and say, hey, mm -hmm. we need to work, come together and, and, and be able to submit information and, and not be afraid to share where you're at mm -hmm. and, and be able to benchmark and then, and then address these issues through various technologies, through various initiatives, working through, through partnering with your local utility mm -hmm. to address those issues. I think that's gonna be key for us is understanding uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, database. Yeah. And earlier you were talking about weather data as well. Yes. Um, so it seems like these external data sources, especially when combined with your internal data, um, will be really helpful. Okay, so uh, another question is, uh, what is the future of energy companies' relationship with customers? Um, and in the next five years or in the next 50 years, if you can think that far down the road, um, and like, what does data have to do with this? Yeah, I think I think I want to tie it back to your customer uh, kind of journey and, and 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 being able to profile. I think one of the things that we're really no noticing is that customers want a one-stop shop when it comes to energy as well. So I think one of the things about uh, uh, digitalization is that we're going to be able to enable, um, you know, utilizing mobile apps to be able to make transactions with your local utility, mm -hmm. be more transparent about how you're using your energy. Uh, being able to give you uh, give customers the ability to be more efficient in the way that you use energy. So I think uh, the whole digital frontier with utilities, and then again, getting to know your customer is going to be a big transition mm -hmm. in, 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 in the next few years. Yeah, um, and definitely understanding how your customer base differs, you know, understanding their journey, where Correct. they're at, what, what really motivates them. Correct. I think those things are important. Um, okay, we have another question, and that is uh, electricity savings slide for CHP. Wouldn't that cost savings vary by location? Uh, I don't see electric prices increasing where I'm located. So fluctuating prices of CHP. Yes, and that's very interesting. Um, so one of the things that we're seeing with, with electric prices, and that is correct, again, one of the reasons why uh, here in the Commonwealth, we're seeing kind of stable power prices. Again, is we don't have many adverse effects when it comes to weather, but we are starting to see increases in that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, again, to address that question, if, if you're not seeing higher prices of energy in, in these locations, there still could be a play for, for, for CHP when it comes to resiliency. So mm -hmm. economics is definitely one of the factors mm -hmm. that customers should be looking at, right. but resiliency right. should be a, a, a second right. important factor when, when, you, when you look at uh, different alternative mm -hmm. forms of energy and, and on-site power generation. Yeah, and it seems like from a lot of the things that you've said today that forms of energy each have strengths and weaknesses. Correct. And so uh, kind of like an energy grid of the future utilizes different types of energy to ensure continuity. Correct. And in, as we're talking about that, you, you, one of the things that we're really noticing is that you have to really look at, at it from an ecosystem point of view, mm -hmm. is understanding that CHP or renewables or battery storage is going to be part of it. Mm -hmm. it's not, we want to be more sustainable and, and more resilient. Uh, all these different technologies will have to play a factor yeah. in our future. Yeah. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today, unfortunately. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in and participated today. And a very big thank you to William. It was great talking with you. No, thank you for having me. Um, if you would like to continue the conversation, um, you can contact us, uh, BlastPoint, at info at blastpoint.io or visit our website. Um, you can also contact uh, Peoples uh, at Let's Talk at peoplesgas.com. Um, and if you'd like to listen to this webinar again or share it, uh, we will be sending a recording to everyone who participated via email. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day.